Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Dr. Daniela Vergara. She's an evolutionary biologist, data analyst, educator, scientific writer, and public speaker. In addition to her multiple publications, she founded and directs a nonprofit organization, the Agricultural Genomics Foundation. AGAF aims to make hemp and cannabinoid science available to a broad public. Dr. Vergara recently joined the Harvest New York Extension team from Cornell University as an emerging crop specialist to help hemp farms with their crop. Dr. Vergara's scientific publications include the comparison of the cannabinoids by the federally produced cannabis to that produced by the private market. These results were featured in news platforms such as The Atlantic, Science, and 538. Recently, she published a comparison between the genome of these federally produced varieties to the genome of the varieties found in the private markets. Some of her other scientific publications are a compilation of the existing genomic tools available for cannabis research that was featured in Science and the maternally inherited genomes, chloroplast and mitochondria. Vergara has authored these publications along with collaborators from the private sector and the cannabis industry, as well as academics from several institutions worldwide. Through AGF, Vergara educates the public about science, data and analysis, statistics, evolutionary biology, and genomics. Now on to the show. Hi, Daniela. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hi, Taz. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited that we're getting the opportunity to talk. Uh, why don't we start off by giving listeners a little bit of your background? Perfect. So now I am in Cornell University in the Cooperative Extension. I am the Emerging Crop Specialist, and I am working with um, hemp and hops. Um, and I am a lecturer at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where I was for eight years. Um, as a researcher, and I still have some uh, ongoing research projects at CU Boulder as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what that role is exactly as an emerging crop specialist. What uh, what does that mean? Like, what's your day to day look like? My day to day, it's very flexible. Um, but I have to go to meet a bunch of people in New York State that are related to um, the cannabis industry. Um, for example, growers um, that are growing uh, cannabis for multiple purposes, wh- whether it's for cannabinoids or for fiber or for grain. There's not a lot of people growing for grain, for example, but that's something that I hope changes. But also uh, figuring out how to help the industry thrive. So people that are processors, or I had a great meeting last Thursday or Friday with this company that has, that they're doing biochar and they're doing vinegar. And so they're now trying to do it with hemp and how to figure out how to get all of the cannabis, quote unquote, waste from these, growers into their facilities and and make possibilities right and if you're growing cannabis for cannabinoids your stocks could be huge um you can have this ma- this massive plants so how are you gonna get that stock into tiny little chunks what sort of equipment you need in order for there to go to this machine that is called a kiln machine that makes the vinegar and the biochar. So we were thinking about those things. So a better use for all the biomass that's produced during cannabis production. Yes, yes. And also because right now hemp for fiber is getting a lot of traction and there's companies that want to get hemp for fiber. And so you, in order for you to make a t-shirt you need a facility that it's a big facility and it's a multi-million dollar facility. How do you establish that and then 
farmers are not going to start growing hemp for fiber if they don't have a buyer but the buyer is not here because no one is producing it so it's kind of like how do you break that chicken and egg situation um and also for grain right so now there's people that are, are interested in grain but not a lot of people are producing grain so how do we get that started so your role is to sort of support the entire industry and make connections for folks as a way of, of sort of building it within the state it sounds like uh, you and i haven't really talked about your role exactly this is sort of off the cuff um we've been talking more yeah. about your background in genetics which we'll get to here in a second but I was curious to yeah. learn just a bit more about exactly what you're doing. Yeah, you you said it, yeah, and get established connections and then put two plus two together and figure out how we're going to get. So, for example, with this company, it's like, okay, really what we need to do is a transportation company. We need trucks to go from one place to another. And then is that profitable, right? Mm -hmm. Taking out all of those waste and if you're in one side of the of the state which for me new york state is a new state i i moved here recently but if you're in one of the corners of the state for example in new york city does that make sense to to take all of the waste to let's say buffalo right yeah um so so figuring those things out but basically that is my role right now in cornell oh yeah. wonderful wonderful very cool now your background though is is wildly different with your background in genetics. Um, I recently listened to one of your webinars and uh, do you want to just plug the webinar series really quickly before we talk about your webinar um, so folks can can learn about that? What I talked about in the webinar? That well, time? can you talk just really quickly about what the series is that Cornell offers for folks? Like I was able to listen to this for free um, to your, your webinar, but there's other ones that you, you guys put on as well. So that one particularly was between the USDA and Cornell. It was a collaboration and it was a webinar regarding um, cannabis in general. So there were people talking about the economic, um, there were people talking about uh, how you process it. Um, and I talked about the genetics part, but, um, but yeah, there were multiple different talks. It was, I think it was every other wednesday for four months the the spring semester mm -hmm. and so there were multiple talks in, in multiple different subjects regarding cannabis and the videos are all now on, available on youtube i saw on youtube exactly so yes. folks can check those out i'll put a link in the podcast if people want to go back and see what was offered there from uh cornell and the usda and thank you I didn't make all the webinars, but I was able to attend yours uh, where you talked about uh, cannabis genetics and some of your research that you've done around cannabis genetics. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about some of that research and what your findings were? Absolutely. I mean, I, I will, I've been doing that for eight years, so there's a lot. <laughs> there's multiple podcast contents that we can have <laughs> regarding all of my findings, but uh, but yes, so what I what I did and what I continue to do with uh, the University of Colorado in Boulder um, is looking at the genome, the entire genome. So it's basically more genomics than genetics because genetics is more looking at particular genes, but genomics, you look at the entire genome um, and look at uh, the different parts of the genome, right? Because the genome is composed of multiple different parts. Um, you have, for example, the repetitive content of the genome, which people call the junk DNA, which, you know, it's repetitive, right? So you have a bunch of things that look alike and are part in, are, are found in, scattered throughout the genome. Um, so we have a paper trying to describe the, the uh, repetitive content of the genome that was published, I think that was 2019. Um, I looked at the... Um, uh, the cannabinoid genes, I have done a work in the cannabinoid genes as well, and looking at how these cannabinoid genes um, have different copies, the different varieties, different strains vary in the number of copies of cannabinoid genes. That's something that I did as well. Also, characterizing where do these different varieties fall, right? Like, are all 
um, I don't know, blue dreams related to all blue dreams and all of the, um, I don't know, Girl Scout cookies related to Girl Scout cookies. And we find that that's not necessarily the case. There are some, for example, Durban poisons, the ones that we sequence, right? When you sequence a genome, you take all of the letters of the DNA and you kind of transcribe them and then you compare them, right? So you compare, for example, yours and your daughter's and you see how similar they are and then you compare to me, right? And you're going to find that yours and your daughter's are much more similar than either of you are to me. Mm -hmm. um, but we found, for example, that strains that are named um, Girl Scout Cookies, they may not be related at all. Um, and strain... Can I ask you a question about that? Now, when you talk about cookies, I think of a very distinct morphological plant structure. Like it's gonna, it's going to, like I can look at a plant and say, okay, that, that probably has some cookies genetics in it or something. Did you guys look at that by chance or were you strictly looking at, at the genetic code? We were strictly looking at the genome. And then how were you determining whether or not a plant fell into was being classified as Girl Scout cookies, for example. Were you going just strictly off how the name was listed or known publicly yeah. based on how people were describing it, either the breeder or, yeah. or the grower? Or the grower, yeah. Okay. They would tell us, what is this? That's Girl Scout cookies. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, that would fit with sort of what I think a lot of people think anecdotally is that, you know, these names, these cultivars are not necessarily what we thought they were. Um, yeah. so your, your findings on that was essentially that just because something was named Girl Scout cookies didn't actually mean that it was related to other things named Girl Scout cookies. Exactly. Were you able totally to determine right. exactly yeah. what was truly, you know, in this case, that particular cult of our goals, Girl Scout cookies, did you have like a known, a known one that you could work off of, work backwards from, I guess? So we had multiple Girl Scout cookies. And what we found is that these Girl Scout cookies could be related to something else. There was one in particular that was related to a strain, Jack Herrera. We actually had two strains, Jack Herrera, that were not related to each other, to each other as well. So, hmm. so this is my take home message, right? My take home message. And when people ask me about it, mm -hmm. what I tell them is, look, go to a dispensary, get whatever it is that works for you whether that's named Girl Scout Cookies or whether that's named Pen, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it works for you for whatever it is that you're using it, whether it's for sleeping or especially for medical patients, right? Because if you're doing it recreationally, I mean, I hope that you have fun with whatever it is that you got the day. But if you're for medical patients, then go back to that same dispensary and get the same thing. Whether it's called again, Girl Scout Cookies or Pen, get it again. And then if you go to another dispensary, um, try to ask for the same thing and use it, but chances are that you're not gonna get the same effects. The chances are pretty big that you're not gonna get the same effects. Now, I, I, you know, uh, you and I can see each other right now and I realize uh, listeners of the podcast don't know, you're, holding, you're actually holding up a marking pen, a pen. and that's why you're referencing yeah. pen as the other name. Um, but. I, I guess I would take it a step further. I wonder, so if you go to the same, let's say you go to a dispensary um, and get Girl Scout cookies, couldn't that Girl Scout cookies from a different farm at the same dispensary give you an entirely different effect? And then to take that even one step further, couldn't that same Girl Scout cookie plant that was grown in another facility, exact same cultivar, or even the cultivar within the same facility, if it's grown differently, you know, under different environmental conditions, whether that's nutrients, media, if the farm changes something, um, if they have, uh, you know, changed their lighting, couldn't that also affect your, your expression, cannabinoid expression to where as a medical patient, you're not going to get a consistent response. And so it, it becomes really daunting to really know what's out there at all, I guess. That is a great question. And so you're going to somewhere, any physical characteristic is a product of genes and environment, right? Yes. Um, so nature and nurture. Um, there are some physical characteristics that are more environmentally determined 
there are others that are more uh, genetically determined. For example, weight is a characteristic that is very environmentally determined. Depending on how you eat, weight can change or not, right? So yield in this case too, if we're talking about cannabis, is more- Perhaps. Perhaps. But okay. we don't entirely know. We know that cannabinoids, there is a big- genetic component to cannabinoids. We know that, but we don't know how much of the cannabinoid phenotype is genetic and how much is environmental. We know that it's there is a genetic component and we know that if your parents... So for example, there's this paper from 2014 by Nora Volkov, the NIDA, um, the head of NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, I really like that paper, despite its name. Its name is something like the harmful effects of cannabis, and they never really talk about the harmful effects of cannabis, but they have a really good figure that shows how THC um, amounts have increased through time. Mm -hmm. That makes us think that breeders and growers have used those individuals that have the most THC to be the parents of next generation offspring. That makes us think that cannabis is that, that that THC is a heritable component in cannabis, right? So in humans, for example, height is extremely heritable. If you're tall, it's likely that your kids are gonna be tall. It's something like 80% heritable. The other 20% is environment. If you didn't eat the right uh, food, especially when you were growing up, you're not gonna achieve that amount of height that you could have if you had eaten the right um, diet, right? Mm -hmm. So with cannabinoids, we think it's similar. You have the potential of producing a bunch of cannabinoids depending on your genes, but you could achieve it depending on whether you have the right soil, the light is super important, um, right? So, so the right conditions. So we do know that there is a genetic component, but, uh, but it all depends on the environment. Now, if we were talking about another crop that wasn't cannabis, something that's, you know, understood genetically, like very well, like yeah. corn or, corn. you know, so, some other major crop, wheat, whatever, whatever that may be. Can, can you give us more, could you, could you give us more definitively an idea of how much is heritable in terms of characteristics versus how much is environmental is the issue. I guess my question really is, is the issue, the fact that there's, so much diversity in cannabis and we don't really know so much that much about it or is the issue just plants in general when it comes to understanding genetics like this no i think it's cannabis because i mean for multiple reasons right because cannabis has been illegal for so long because cannabis has not been cultivated um in um in a very scientific manner right um with corn, for example, we know that um, there are particular cultivars that are for sweet corn, right? Um, and so there is a genetic component to it. Um, now, again, we know that in cannabis, there is a genetic component to it. If you are gonna cultivate for cannabinoids for THC or CBD, you're not gonna use a fiber cultivar, mm -hmm. right? So we, we know that that exists now. For example, the word cultivar means individuals that have been cultivated for particular reasons, and I don't think that we are there in cannabis, right? So we can see it in, in at least in the cannabis industry for, for recreational purposes for, for marijuana. You can see that these names do not mean much, and the names also indicate sativa hybrid, they do not mean much either. So that's why for medical patients that's what i recommend go to the same dispensary get the same thing because you know that hopefully it's going to be the same grower that it's going to be using the same soil or, or cocoa or the same nutrient regime um and hopefully it's going to be the same variety right it's going to be a mother or or the daughter of that mother plant right so so you're expecting it to be consistent at least with that same dispensary Yes, as I was as it was explained to me, the term cultivar is really the best term to use for what we're talking about with cannabis. You know, sort of what people are calling strains, because it's really a cultivated variety, um, which is how cultivar was described to me by my uh, botany professor. 
um, which allows keep, like, keeps me. It, it's my mnemonic for how I remember that it's not really a varietal. It's, it's a it's a cultivated varietal, so it's a ver, it's a cultivar. <laughs> yeah, but then you're expecting it to have particular phenotypic characteristics, right? So ah. you're expecting it to have, for example, I don't know, the stock diameter is blah, and the height is blah, and the cannabinoid production is blah. So you know exactly what you're getting, right? So mm-hmm. I usually talk about dogs because people. You know, people care about dogs and people, I guess. But when you think about a chihuahua, you are, and I tell you chihuahua, you close your eyes and you picture a chihuahua. You do not picture a Rottweiler. Yes. So they have been bred for these particular conditions, which we do not have in cannabis, right? And something that we do find looking at the genome is that there is a lot of variation, right? And if the word on the street is right, that, for example... Chemdog number one and chemdog chem number four. So number one was the first seed that popped or the first one, and then chemdog number four was the fourth one, but they are siblings. And yet they have entirely different phenotypes. Mm-hmm. So you have full sibs that are entirely different from each other. And that means that there is a lot of variation that it's out there. And that when you're doing crosses, you don't know what to expect when you are crossing a female and a male. And I think that that's why it's so popular to to have mother plants and to do cloning, because then that way you are having more consistency, right? Because the breeding has not been uh, done in enough in breeding for multiple generations. You don't you don't find when you talk to 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 people in the industry, it's like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, like four generations in breeding. And it's like, well, no, you need several generations to assure that there's going to be homozygosity, which means that, you know, the gene coming from mom and the gene coming from dad are going to be the same, that they're going to be homozygous, right? Um, so so you need multiple generations uh, of inbreeding that has not been done, you know, maybe 20, at least, at least eight or 12. And that is not common. So you get a bunch of different things when you cross two individuals, a tall plant, a short plant, you know, high cannabinoids or cannabinoids, right? So in order to be a cultivar, it needs to have a consistent expression, is essentially what we're saying. And we're not there yet. Um, Well, isn't part of the challenge then for breeders, the fact that the general population, you know, its consumers are constantly changing uh, what they want chasing these, you know, what people call hype strains, this idea that, you know, there's always something better around the corner. Yes. Uh, I agree. And I think that that's the cool thing, right? That there's always something new and always something better. And that's why you do pheno hunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. However, that comes with a cost and the cost is the lack of consistency and the lack of if you have a limited amount of space and you cross these two plants, this female and this male, or, or you reversed this female and you're crossing them and they're awesome, both of them are awesome, chances are that their kids could, there could be awesome kids and not that awesome, right? You can have some offspring that are not that cool. And then if you have a limited amount of space, you have to choose which ones you're going to be um, planting, which which seeds you're going to be popping. And and maybe you didn't pop that one seed that was the coolest one. So, so yeah, so consistency brings consistency. When you have inbreeding, then you are assuring that all of your individuals are going to be the best. It, you bring up this, the challenges around breeding. Um, now genetics and testing have allowed, have allowed shortcuts in this process, um, some of which are more controversial than others uh, with, with, with growers. Now, I could, at a very relatively young age, know the gender of my plant or know, um, get an idea of what the uh, phenotypic expression might be, right, from, from testing if we look at the, at the gen, at a genetic sample, um, you know, I'm not, and this is not talking about gene editing at this point. Um, what, what tools are there out there to growers, um, that is, that are not, I guess, gene editing? 
Well, I don't think that we're in gene editing yet, although it's coming I though, right? It's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for any for every crop, right? For the strawberries that you had this morning in your cereal, yeah. For rice, yeah. Um, but um, but there are certain tools. Look, sex in sex determination, sex expression in cannabis is another big kind of worms um, because. You can sex reverse them, right? Um, and so, if you put in, I don't know, colloidal silver or silver nitrate, they can produce flowers from the opposite sex. Um, or ethophan in males, they can produce female flowers. So, even though there's an X on the Y chromosome, like cannabis has an X and a Y chromosomes, like we do, and we do think that the X and the Y chromosomes in, in cannabis um, are very important to establish sex. Uh, but we also think that there may be other genes somewhere else related to sex expression, because even if you are an XX and they put silver nitrate, you can produce flowers of the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not lacking a Y, right? And there's multiple companies out there that, um, that they have feminized seeds. So they take a female, they stress it or put colloidal silver the female produces male flowers and then they use that pollen to uh, either self-fertilize that female or to fertilize another female and then you're assuring that there's no y chromosome right mm -hmm. so even if you have that sometimes you can even produce male flowers right so it's likely that the genes related to sex are found somewhere else in the genome that are not necessarily the x and the y chromosomes um I don't know why I started talking about sex, oh, but I okay, that there gender identification at earlier stages. We don't have to flower a plant out to determine its gender necessarily. If you have now. A, yeah, exactly. Whether you have a Y chromosome. There are tests that tell you that tell you yes, you do have a Y chromosome or not, you don't. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is possible. That doesn't tell you whether that individual when stressed out is going to produce flowers of the opposite sex. It doesn't tell you. Or if that individual is ammonitious, it doesn't tell you that. But it does tell you whether it's going to have, it has a Y. So those are available. There's also uh, tests related to cannabinoid production and whether your plant is prone to produce cannabinoids mm -hmm. uh, or THC at least. Um, yeah, there, there are some tests available. Are there any available right now that can give us an idea of terpene expression? Is that's become much more important, I think, to cultivators? Mm, not that I know of. I may be mistaken, but um, so we don't know I the those the topics. genetic markers for pinene or or limonene or any of these different um, terpenes that you're aware of. <laughs> the terpenes are are a big. Um, yeah, another big kind of worm is because it seems like with terpenes, there is something that we call called pleiotropy and epistasis, and they are interacting to get, to produce the phenotype. And that means that there could be one gene that affects multiple traits or that there's um, one trait that is affected by multiple genes. Okay. Right, the opposite. So it's not and just it seems, this causes this. It's a more complicated picture. Yes, and there is a paper that I really, really like by uh, Jordan Zager, and his in from Washington State actually. Yeah. In Pullman, and his a, his advisor uh, Mark Lange, and they are proposing that there is this network of genes, which I think that it's very accurately. They do more of mathematical models and stuff, but I I do think that that depict. Not only that terpenes, but also the cannabinoids, right? It's this complex network of genes that are, are acting together. Right now I'm working on a paper and although I'm using only nine individuals total, because for those nine individuals, we have like the entire genome placed together. Like we have the entire puzzle. So we were able to count the genes and to look for the location of the genes. But what we found is that, um, well, yeah, there are multiple genes that are related to cannabinoid productions. Um, and for example, there's this one individual canatonic 
a, and this individual canatonic has uh, truncated, so uh, an incomplete CBD gene and also an incomplete THC gene. However, it produces CBD and THC. Hmm. So there, that suggests, right? Like this is not a definitive answer, but it suggests that there are multiple other genes that are affecting the production of cannabinoids. Despite the canonical THC and the canonical CBD, there's other multiple genes that are affecting the, the production of these cannabinoids. Interesting. I actually had Jordan on the podcast to talk about his paper around powdery mildew and a marker that they had found mm-hmm. on that. Um, so folks could check that out. Now, from what you're saying, it, it, it sounds like there's, there's quite a bit we just haven't figured out about the cannabis genome and how it's expressed. Um, what do you think, what do you think the future holds in terms of research? Oh, there's so many things, so many things. I mean, all of what I said about sex, right? Like where are the genes that are related to sex determination? All of the, what I said about cannabinoids, right? Like, um, are these genes interacting? How are these genes related to the expression? When you grow them in good conditions or in bad conditions, how do the expressions differ? And then, or terpenes, right? Um, and also, um, when do you express certain traits? For example, in, in in terpenes or in sex, right? When when would you express? Like we know that if we put colloidal silver or silver nitrate, then it expresses the male flowers. But I am applying that colloidal silver mm-hmm. in nature when why would you do that like what is the advantage for you to be producing flowers of the opposite sex so so i think that there's so many questions about it and right now for example we do not have an assembly is when you take the genome right when you have all of the genome all of the dna letters and you transcribe them you have to chop them into little pieces and then you have to put them together um and so we have assemblies that are pretty complete However, we're lacking the white chromosome and we're lacking the monoecious chromosome. So we still need to complete those. Um, we haven't done it yet. So we're still figuring that out. And, uh, and yeah, and for terpenes, right? Some terpenes are produced when under stress. Like if you're being eaten by a caterpillar, then you produce a terpene. Mm-hmm. Um, so when are these terpenes produced? How are they produced? Um, if you are the same variety, do you produce different terpenes and why? Um, and um, yeah, all of all of that part, like the phenotype. There's a still still a lot of work to do in the phenotype, like, and then you put the the genotype, and that's even more. And then you put expression, and that's even you can add more and more and more layers. Do you see us eventually? understanding cannabis as well as we understand a crop like corn or is it just too much genetic diversity and since we're chasing so many different um i guess medical therapeutic or recreational um outcomes with this particular plant that uh, we'll never get the stability to really get the, the, that would then further lead to the research that would allow us to like completely understand what's going on. No, I think so. Yeah. We have enough tools. We have genetic tools. We have smart people. I do think so that that's going to happen. Um, I think that much faster than it happened to many other crops because we have the tools available and it has been done for other crops. Right. So it's Mm kind of like, taking what has been done in rice or in tomatoes and then applying it. Uh, I think that the thing in cannabis is that first, people think that they're going to make money right now. Like, okay, like this is it and I'm going to make money tomorrow. And science is slow and breeding is slow and breeding differs depending on the environment, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever you have in Oregon, may not work here in new york whatever you have there in washington where you are may not work here or may not work in colorado right um yeah as a cultivator we see genetics plays a a, you know a a significantly heritable role 
when it comes to um, disease, for example, well, and yield, but I mean, particularly disease, you know, we'll have um, with an outdoor crop or even with an indoor facility and there's certain environmental conditions, you'll always have certain plants that will thrive and certain plants that will suffer. Because most growers I know are running, you know, 20, 30, sometimes 40 different cultivars or more um, varietals, whatever you want to call them, in their in their facility or in their field. And, and we do see that certain, you know, certain plants will suffer more than others and certain plants will thrive uh, in the exact same environmental condition. So we know genetics plays, uh, you know, a, a fairly large role, right? I mean, we, yeah. we don't know yeah. exactly how large, but pretty large. What interests me, I think, is figuring out how, if we took particular genetics, um, how we maximize the gen genetic potential of that plant. So if we took, you know, whatever you mentioned, you know, chem dog number four, figure out exactly how that plant likes to be grown that we could cater our lighting, our nutrients, our, our media, our environment to really optimize whatever particular cannabinoid expression or terpene expression that we, that we really want from the plant. Like that to me is, is really the most interesting. Cause right now as a grower, I'm just trying to create conditions that are optimal for most of my plants to at least achieve a certain amount of yield or a certain expression. Um, that I know that the general public or the, the medical community is going to want to purchase, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, how do we take that a step further to where we really dial it in by, you know, eventually a cultivar, but let's say a varietal. Um, how, do, how do we get there? What's that process look like? That's a complicated question, but I do think that if you're growing indoors, it's much easier, right? Sure. Because you have a, the environment is constant. And what I've seen, for example, I have a friend in, in Denver, what he does is that he has his set conditions. And this is a light regime, this is a nutrient regime. And if this variety does well here, perfect. If not, you're out. Like he doesn't adequate the nutrients and the, the conditions to the variety, but the opposite. So there are only certain strains that he grows. Mm -hmm. um which i think it's pretty smart you know like he already has this this figured out like okay this is going to be the light this is going to be and then he brings varieties or not um so i think that that is pretty smart now if you're growing outdoors then it's different right then that's then that is where 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 things get complicated um because as you were saying there's a bunch of there's a there's a bunch of things that can happen right um and disease is one of them for example that you can control indoors much more than outdoors right so so you need to figure out which ones are those individuals that are resistant and cross cross those and then that means that you need to do some sort of inbreeding because if you're crossing those and then again, what we were talking about, there's no inbreeding. So you can get a bunch of different things and height differences and all of the phenotypes can vary. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, can we talk a little bit about phenotypes? So you, you had written a authored a paper uh, called widely assumed phenotypic associations in cannabis sativa lack a shared genetic basis. Can you just touch on sort of what your findings were with that? Yeah, that, that was a nice paper. Um, <laughs> and I want to give, I, yeah, I love that paper. I want to give a, a shout out to Ben Holmes from Centennial Seeds and uh, Front Range Biosciences because he made that possible and he's a um, known breeder in Colorado. Um, so we measured a bunch of different physical characteristics of phenotypes in these individuals these were a cross, they were a cross between a hemp type and a marijuana type. And so we measured a bunch of different traits. I don't know, height, pedial length, leaf shape. Uh, we had three different cannabinoids and we found that they are not correlated. So you cannot correlate the leaf shape with um, percent THC or you cannot correlate height 
with leaf shape or right so you those are completely not correlated so mm -hmm. there are people in the industry that can say for example oh this smells like i don't know lemon or this smells like pine and therefore it was tall and had broad leaves which it's not the case right and how i say it in how i yeah, explain it to people is that you cannot you cannot say, oh, you're tall because you have blue eyes. Those traits are completely not correlated. Or you have brown eyes and therefore you're blonde, right? Like those things are completely not correlated. Um, and so in the industry, for example, those things, oh, it's a broad leaf and therefore it's this type of strain and therefore it's this grouping, it's a hybrid or it's an indica or it's a sativa that doesn't, that is completely not related whatsoever. You can have individuals that have broad leaves and have high THC or individuals that have narrow leaf and have high THC or individuals that are tall and have high THC or individuals that are short and have high THC they, that is completely not correlated at all. Was there anything from um, the physical characteristics of, of a plant that correlated with the you know, medicinal or therapeutic side, the cannabinoid, terpene, you know, any of that side of things? nothing no i mean we do see correlations between the cannabinoids right the cannabinoids are very all of these genes are acting in unison all of these genes right they have the same precursor molecule which is cbga right so cbga the mother cannabinoid they all of these different enzymes thca synthase cbda synthase cbca synthase they act on the same precursor molecule so we do see correlations between the cannabinoids Mm -hmm. which is expected right but not at all between height or video length or leaf shape or nothing no mm -hmm. interesting interesting so yeah i don't really know what to <laughs> what to add to that <laughs> uh other than that they're just there's no correlation so we can't look at a plant physically and have any idea of what's going on internally in terms of what it's going to produce is no, all of this, found out. yeah, these physical traits, you have to measure them, right? You have to measure the THC, the CBD, and then if you do breeding, you can have all narrow leaves with, all of your plants could be narrow leaves. All of them could have like these really thin narrow leaves and all of them can vary in the amount of THC that they produce, mm -hmm. right? And that's, so I have been asked before, these questions like okay you found that there i had this other paper with the leafly with pe the people from leafly where we looked also at the sativa indica hybrid and we found that sativa indica hybrid has no correlation with the cannabinoids or the terpenes that the plant produces right um and we we also know that the genetics right that the genome does not correlate with the indica sativa hybrid we also know that what I, we were talking earlier, that you can have a strain named Girl Scout Cookies and another strain named Girl Scout Cookies that are not related at all whatsoever. Um, so when when people ask me like, okay, so w what does this mean? And that for me, it means that if you have a high times best strain that was this, I don't know, this um, purple haze or whatever, this tangerine dream, then change the name. And next year, just call it Pen. Mm -hmm. And it can also be the high times best strain because that doesn't mean anything. The names do not mean anything. Names do not mean right? anything when it comes to the plant. Okay. No, no. Market it again and then call it something else. Like that <laughs> is my advice, right? <laughs> it, it is really challenging. Um, it, it's it's unfortunate because I think some of the the oral histories around some of these plants is is fascinating and it's something that I'm trying to dive into in another podcast right now. Um, unrelated, I mean, it's not scientific at all, but I think the stories behind these plants is really interesting, and I think that all gets lost as we move towards people, you know, just renaming things and everything just being jumbled and we don't really know what's what out there in the industry, um, unfortunately, but that's a, that's another issue. 
But I don't think that we're going to know unless we sequence their genomes and unless we create kind of like this either genetic barcode or this phenotypic barcode, right? And 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 that's why I think that um, testing facilities and reliable testing facilities are really important because you go there and you know that this has however much mercine and CBD and CBG and terpenoline and et cetera, et cetera. And then you can create kind of like this phenotypic barcode for your strain. And then if you sequence it, then you can create this genomic barcode for your strain right and i don't think that these names and you know so and so was in this concert in 1991 and blah 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 and that, that's how this strain that's that's just an anecdote it's totally an anecdote i just think it's uh some of the stories are interesting you know purely as anecdotal stories you know entertainment um but one yeah. thing you brought up was the labs, and I think that's a whole nother issue is lab reliability. I know in certain states, as emerging states came into play, uh, the labs that gave the highest THC percentages were the ones that then survived and people would use because they, you know, the cultivators could market and sell their product for more. Or the labs that were passing people on heavy metals were the ones that, in, that people used because... You know, it's it's so it becomes all economic at a certain point. And I think that's where it becomes really hard to use any of that data for science because it, there is so much variability, even on the lab side, I would argue. I agree and I disagree with what you just say. I agree because I know that that happens. Um, and I can tell you which ones to go to in the Boulder, Denver area. Like, <laughs> I, I, I know that, right? And however, however, uh, this paper that I was talking about with the people from Leafly, Nick Jacomis and, and Christiana Smith. So it's a paper that was actually published this year between, a, yeah, Christiana, myself, um, Brian Keegan, who's a professor at CU Boulder, and he and I have, this is our second paper together, and uh, Nick Jacomis, so the four of us. And what we did is that we analyzed all of the strains from Leafly, all of the chemotypes. And we looked at cannabinoids, we looked at terpenes, we looked at correlations between cannabinoids and terpenes, between terpenes and then, you know, the names. So so this is indica or this is sativa, this is hybrid. And we, we did this beautiful statistical analysis and machine learning analysis and the figures are beautiful. And I love the figures because I did the figures. So, and I hope <laughs> that people like the figures because it took me a long time to do those figures to make them really pretty. Um, so... In that paper, Leafly works with six different labs across the U.S. There's a lab in Washington State, Oregon, I think California, uh, Florida, Michigan. So there's labs in multiple different parts of the U.S. And something that we measured was how different the labs were. And the labs were very consistent between them despite one of them being in Florida and the other one in Michigan and the other one in Washington state, mm -hmm. they were very consistent. So I was, and I was very positively surprised because despite the cannabis industry being so differently regulated everywhere, despite cannabis being still federally illegal, you have these labs that are very consistent and you have these people that are doing wonderful jobs and you know, like, I like, I want to congratulate these people because they don't know each other. They and and they are putting out very reliable results. So, but you still have those labs, which, as you just mentioned, you know, like so and so will spike your THC or so and so will you know will give you a pass on heavy metals. You still have those. So also, I think that we should congratulate Leafly because Leafly now knows they have really high standards and they're really good at vetting who they're going to work with, which was, in a way, my take-home message. Like, Leafly knows who they're working with and Leafly knows consistent results. So, so there, there are possibilities out there as well. These weren't six randomized labs then. They were labs that were vetted and are using the same SOPs, correct? vetted by Leafly. I don't know if they were using the same SOPs. I know that they did have different equipment, I think. You know, like, it's not like everyone had Agilent or everyone had Shimatsu. Okay. Um, no, but they 
uh, they were labs that were vetted by Leafly and Leafly just chooses those labs in order to gather the, their data. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Well, you know, I got to figure there's good labs out there, just like there's good cultivators that are following the rules and there's other ones that are, you know, spraying illegal pesticides or plant growth hormones or things that, you know, are not safe for humans. Yeah. So I just think yeah. that's human nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think labs have potential, but I think we have to acknowledge that there's challenges with lab testing as much as there is with genetics and diversity and everything else <laughs> that's going on with trying to better understand this plant. Yeah. 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 No, that's true. You know, there's good restaurants and bad restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, was there anything else that you wanted to share regarding, you know, the research you've done or anything that you're really excited about in the upcoming year uh, related to the industry? So uh, I don't know when this podcast is going to be published, but um, I also worked on the varieties produced by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA. Um, I have a paper on 2017 regarding the phenotype where we compared the cannabinoids uh, of um, varieties or of strains that you can find in dispensaries to those that are produced by NIDA. And then uh, on 2021, we have the genome. We looked at the genome from from um, NIDA's varieties. I'm going to be giving a talk uh, at the end of August regarding that. Um, so the take home message is that, you know, NIDA varieties are not representative of what people are using. Um, neither in the phenotype nor in the genotype, right? Like NIDA's varieties are different and because NIDA has this monopoly where they are the only ones that produce the cannabis that is used for medicinal or, or a research, right? Medicinal research or, or, or any sort of scientific research. So, um, NIDA's varieties are different from everything that people actually consume. Um, so I'm going to be talking about that at so, the end of August. So if the plants that NIDA is using to it are used for, do they influence national policy or are they primarily just what they're supplying to the scientific community? Um, so, so it does influence policy. Uh, how, how does that work if their plants that they have are so genetically different than what everyone else is consuming and using? Exactly. Or is this just typical government uh, bureaucracy? Okay. I mean, how could that be? Um, how could how could that research be not biased, right? Like, how could you have research that is reliable when you are producing the varieties for research and your weed is completely different from everyone else else's, right? So, how how, how your, is your research reliable? What are those differences then, out of curiosity? Um, the main well, differences in, in respect to cannabinoids, uh, they have very little variation. So the diversity of cannabinoids is much a uh, less, so less diverse, mm -hmm. and the amount of cannabinoids is less. So it's less um, THC, less CBD, more CBN. More of the breakdown compounds. <laughs> the CVN is actually significantly more. And then regarding the genome, which was the, the 2021 paper, they are different from everything else, right? It's like, you know, like they tell you, um, you can study dogs, but you can only study Labradors. Forget about the Chihuahuas or French Poodles or right? Great Danes, you can only study this one thing. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. So, so it's completely different from what everyone else is consuming. Okay. And what are the implications of uh, really high CBN relative to what is on the market? So CBN is a breakdown product, right? And CBN accumulates usually when you have a lot of heat, when you leave your cannabis in um, for a long time, long periods of time it accumulates and um, and then it's usually that cannabinoid that gives you the headaches um, mm. or usually that that it kind of like makes you drowsy 
Um, so that is a cannabinoid that um, that NIDA has a lot of. Interesting. And yeah. it gets expressed, you said, from heat stress? No. So it's a breakdown product. So THC um, turns into CBN. It's actually um, an oxidation process. Oh, okay. So THC turns into CBN. And, uh, um, you know, like something else that I think that is going on in the cannabis industry, at least in the, yeah, in the legal markets, is that people really put a lot of effort in producing really good weed, right? And in marketing themselves as, you know, like mines are the stinkiest or yours are the prettiest or mines are the tallest or yours are purple, right? And it's this competition in making the best weed. How am I going to differentiate myself and my brand and, and making the best weed? And then you have NIDA producing the cannabis for research, which is not the best, not diverse, not potent, with a lot of breakdown product, like, and that's what scientists have to study, right? Hmm. So. Yeah, I don't know a lot about the medical chemical side. That's never, that hasn't been my area of interest as much. Um, do you see the CBN thing is interesting to me though. So do you see that still existing in the general market in just much lower levels of plant expression? So like when I go to a dispensary, for example, I'm not going to necessarily, when that plant gets oxidized, I'm not going to get a headache because I'm not going to get as much the same levels of CBN that I would from a, say a NIDA plant. Yeah. However, if you leave, if you buy flour and you leave that nug, in your in your garage the entire summer and then you know come october you take that nug it's it's likely that the thc would have converted into cbn oh okay i didn't i didn't know that that's like i said that's not something i've ever looked into so i'm sure there's a lot of listeners that know exactly what you're talking about right now so but hopefully there's some like me that are learning something right now and that's uh, really interesting. So thanks for sharing. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate your time. I know it took a little bit to get on this call together with our schedules, um, but I really enjoyed it. And, and thank you for sharing some of your research and knowledge and I hope we can stay in touch and talk again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on this. This was really fun. I, I, I'm glad that you learned something new. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay. Bye. That was Dr. Daniela Vergara, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. If you like the podcast, please leave us a rating and review and give us a follow on Instagram. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage to stay up to date on the latest research and information. Thanks for listening.